What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and welcome huh, to the Meat Blog Podcast. This is episode 105. And I was recently just on my computer and going through my digital recorder, which I use as an interface. And, uh, well, it's when I did that farm conference, and I was just checking, clearing the space off the SD drive that I put into that thing because I it ran out at the farm conference. So I wanted to know, like, well, what was on here? And here's a bunch of recordings. Uh, in the beginning, me and David used this as a recording device to help us cord, uh, record simultaneously. So there's some frustrating outtakes from there. Um, also, I took it to work and then just some random stuff here and there that I did. And I'll, I'll introduce each segment. So hope you enjoy it. Here's David and I doing, I think, the third episode together. And this never made it in the show. Until now, I just, yeah, you, you, I, we really peel back the curtain so you can understand our dynamic and how he is truly my better half. Wait, I mean, do you want to go pee real quick? No. I find it, right. as, I'm going to use it as a motivator. Okay. Okay. I don't know if I could recreate what we did. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. Maybe you should pee first. Mm, No. The tri-tip is a cut of beef that comes from the bottom sirloin that also connects... Puck. All right. Do the one, two, three thing. It'll help you in the end editing. All right. One, two, three. Three. The tri tip is a cut of beef that comes from the knuckle, also known as the sirloin tip, that connects to the top sirloin. It is triangular in shape with a fat cap about half an inch thick. It is one and a half to two and a half pounds. And there's only two per carcass. The sides. It, fuck. What the hell is that noise? Did you hear that? It sounds like a fucking dryer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hold on. So, growing up in Southern California, if you went to a barbecue. Fuck. God damn it. I'm ready to burn this episode. <laughs> like, I... I... We're, we're getting there. We're getting there. No, but, like, it's not going to be as good as it was. It, it, there's too many fucking things going on around me. It's, it's not going to be as good as it was, only because we've done it as many times. But if we clear our heads and come back to it, it will be. Yeah. Um... Just like recording music. Yeah, that's true. Okay, hey, that, that, that was a that's good, what that, I want. That was a that was a good flow. I'll I'll try to I'm, I'll try to get tap back into that. Um, I kind of lost that flow a little bit. I'll try to find it here. Um. Okay, do you want to start it over? Like the whole thing? Yeah. No. Um, okay. just pick it up from, I talked about New York. So here, this next one is, uh, my wife, Melissa, Ryan and myself went to one of my wife's old coworkers house to kill and process some lambs. And, uh, Ryan, uh, killed his first lamb that day. Uh, there's many firsts. So when I lived, uh, before I moved here at the beach, I lived in, a area of like Wacom County off Lake Wacom called Sutton Valley, which is a gated community. We had HOAs and I also had a basement cut and shot, uh, cut and wrap in my basement. And so 
we killed these lambs. I was going to bring them back to my house. There was snow on the ground, so I was going to leave the door open except for the screen. And that would be my cooler until I processed them the next day. And I did this a few times for people here and there. Uh, I bought the house. Uh, they had a health important department inspected kitchen because the previous owners ran a barbecue smoked food truck uh, that they were able to operate from their house. And that was always weird. The few times that I did process animals, there's, you know, bringing carcasses on my shoulder, backing up my truck, uh, and then having my neighbors be like, hey, what, 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 what's going on there? Oh, yeah, the last guy, he he just smoked me. He didn't he didn't do whatever the hell you're doing. So, as we're driving back from this lamb slaughter, it was uh ill prepared. Like it, it all got done, it got stuff like that, but it's one of the events that made me just realize I didn't have that much fun or um I didn't sa- find it satisfactory to the level of work I was putting in to doing custom exempt on the weekends that especially with my son growing up that I kind of ducked out of it. But this was one of those things where it's just like, man, this is, uh, I'd rather just spend my Saturday not doing this. And the killing went fine. It was everything else that afterwards of, you know, cutting and wrapping, you know, six lambs by myself and then trying to problem solve how I'm going to process some of them. So here you go. It was, uh, it's normal. <laughs> yeah. Although I haven't shot one before, but still. Just fell in. It's good. Thanks for letting me do that. I don't put my seatbelt on. it by hand. What? <laughs> you don't think you'd be able to take it into work real quick? I will. I'm gonna, well, I'll make that judgment call to see how much trim I have. I'm going to also weigh the trim and I'm not going to, I'm just going to grind it all together and just this person, this one lamb equals this. Or do you think? I've got this, we've got this electric grind. Oh, we can see about Judy's. Oh, yeah. I don't know if she got anything better than a lot of little tiny houses out here, it seems like. Yeah. I wouldn't mind living out here in the cuts. But I also want to be close to a major city and my work. Oh, wait, is this the road I turned on? That was not the road she turned on. And yes, that is my wife driving. I hate driving. Uh, That's just a weird fact about me. When given the option to not drive, I will take it. So I ended up borrowing a grinder from my wife's aunt, Judy. And her son listens to the podcast, so hey, Pete. And I I was reading the instructions on the grinder because I just, you know, you always want to make sure you put stuff together correctly. And it pride itself on being able to grind one pound every two minutes. It was a tabletop grinder, and there were several times I thought I was pushing it to the limit, and I got a good forearm workout using this thing because it was maybe a step up or at the same level or a step down from a KitchenAid grinding attachment. Either way, it kept getting gunked up and... You know, even though it was lambs, three of those lambs were completely boned out. 
and ground. And I had to cut them into like stew like pieces. So imagine cutting it all into stew, then putting it in a grinder and then pushing and then going like struggling to get it done. And it's also Sunday and you kill these lambs the day before. Then you got to go to work on Monday. And that's why I ended up getting a case of the fuckets and not wanting to do it anymore. You know, I'll still kill the occasional animal for a friend in need, but bottom line, I, I, I would rather be crabbing. I'd rather be killing crabs on my weekend. And that's certainly not a knock on anything in this industry. It's just it, it, slaughter. It, and that is just, I feel like I only have so many hours of energy in me a week. Maybe that's it. I don't know. So this next segment, I am talking to my friend Zach as we happen to be doing a bunch of labeling for stuff. And yeah, I uh, hope you enjoy this segment with Zach Brewer. By the way, uh, Zach's middle name is literally Micro. So his name is Zach Micro Brewer. That shit's funny. <laughs> That's the American dream. <laughs> the only thing is that I may not be. <laughs> yeah, but then you gotta look at the who is the clientele. Like, look at who who gets female sex workers. So who's gonna get the male sex workers? Have you seen Basketball Diaries? No. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty bad. It's <laughs> oh, a great plug. Start with me. Well, it's like it's a great movie, but it's like Leonardo DiCaprio is a heroin addict. And it's like young Leonardo DiCaprio. Like, uh, like right, right after Growing Pains. Okay, like that Romeo and Juliet movie they made in that time frame? Yeah, maybe the 90s. Been before that. Let me just. And he had like one ear pierced. I used to watch the Growing Pains on syndication. Zach, you were born in, like, 99. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Leonardo DiCaprio. He should update his profile picture. He's a producer of 65 films. What? Have I heard of... Oh, I think... Is he just, like, on the producing crew for some of them? He was in the Outsiders TV series. Oh, I was like, he was definitely not in the movie. Or he was he... in one episode of Roseanne. I hope they bring him back. He was in 23 episodes of Growing Pains. Then Poison Ivy. Then What's Eating Gilbert Grape. This Boy's Life. The Foot Something Party. The Quick and the Dead. In the Basketball Diaries in 95. Romeo and Juliet was 96. Pardon me. You have the IMV app? Yeah, everyone does. Everyone does? Here is Lacey Zope and I just pretty much checking levels before I did the Leaf episode about her soap company. Are you sure? No. I've been making pizza. And my husband wonders, like, were you going to put, like, real stuff on it? Like, some pepperoni on it. I'm making, like, spinach pizza, whole grain crust. It's just, like, not good. Wait, where are you something? Oh. For your dog. Oh, thank you. This is the scented kind. What's the smell like? Uh, it's got a little bit of lavender essential oil and then some, um, Fragrance oil. Okay. It's synthetic, but it doesn't contain like all the really nasty stuff. Yeah. Sounds from these condensers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's gonna be a gentle hum. Just a lovely hum. Yeah. Well, it's the best I could do with the, uh, you know, on the run. Oh. I also brought you this printout of this cool article I found. It's like old school lard making. Hmm. I kind of have 
how it used to be that the community event in this one town. Where? I don't know, somewhere. It says on there. <laughs> somewhere in the article. You didn't read it? I did, but I read it a long time ago. And I wasn't looking at like the actual article. I was looking at technique. Oh, okay. So how have you been? I've been good. How's the LARP business? You know, uh, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to, what is the, to angle my marketing, mm-hmm. find the niche market for lard based soaps. Yeah. There's this lady at the farmer's market in Bellingham who sells tallow-based skin creams. Really? you feel like she's stepping in on your... <laughs> no, not at all, because she's very forward with her product. Her product is tallow forward, and mine is more processed. Okay. You know, soap and bubble baths. And I really haven't been advertising it as a non-GMO, pasture-raised pork product. It's more just like a really high-end... I know, I should definitely make little flyers. Yeah. Little handouts and stuff. It's very, very, very grassrootsy and small and yeah. I'm not that's a cheap way of saying I'm not doing enough work on it. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm being lazy about it. <laughs> Alright, so so who 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 are you? Oh we're we're doing the interview now. Mm-hmm. Uh I am Lacey Zope and Well, I hope you enjoyed that part of the show. This is the the night before the release. This is Monday. I'll probably release this in an hour after I equalize it and all that, and I'm coming up on 17 minutes. And that's not enough for the show. And, I, and I'm sorry that this seems like a hastily made episode, but trust me, I've spent the last several days and hours pouring over this audio. So... Let me try to find some questions to answer and fill out the last uh, few minutes of the show. All right. Someone asked me, have you ever been attacked by a vegan verbally or physically? And I don't know why people keep asking me to get uh, vegans on the show and asking me to interview them. And after what I said last time about them and, you know, I, I realized that we both essentially want the same thing that we're going to see eye to eye on many things about, you know, suffering and unneededness and pollution and, you know, our reliance on this industry and, but where I feel like there, you could raise animals correctly and ethically, you know, Um, and that we're in the system that, you know, we need to feed the masses and this is where we are and that, uh, and I want to support small farms. They view, some of them view that there is, you can't do that, that there's no compromise or not a compromise that you just suffering is suffering and they hold animals to a sentient level. And when I was working and when I was working retail in Los Angeles, some street punk woke, woke by, walked by the shop and was wearing an elf shirt and it it not like the lovable Muppet puppet from the eighties, early nineties who eats cats. who's certainly not vegan, but elf in the sense of the liberation front the animal liberation front. Um, and it sparked a con, con uh, a dialogue in the shop about like veganisms and extremisms and all that. And one of the owners is like, well, you know, those people love us because of how we treat or that we support small farms and stuff like that. And I'm just thinking like, I'm sure there's some vegans that love you for that, but, Myself, who worked for a small cut and wrap that catered to small farmers who were going to farmers markets and organic and all the buzzwords that 
health conscious meat eaters and eco friendly meat eaters want to hear, we were threatened with firebomb threats by the Animal Liberation Front. I've gotten numerous death threats on social media, especially from Instagram, from the Animal Liberation Front threatening to kill me, my family. Um, and so, so I never wanted to open up that dialogue. I don't want to be on their radar. I want to skirt underneath it. When I flare up on the radar, people say like, what do you do when you get an extremist? You know, someone's talking to me on a, uh, Facebook and saying these comments or whatever on Instagram, I just block them, block and report. Uh, cause it's 2018. A lot of people can't have just a simple dialogue over text. Uh, it's passionate stuff's misinterpreted and these people don't want to have a simple dialogue. They want to stir up stuff. They want to get you, uh, riled up and you could present the most elegant argument with unarguable facts and not opinions. And it doesn't matter because it's 2018. So I've been threatened in the sense of like, uh, that not physical. Well, I guess like physically, like no one's ever touched me, but like people did threaten to firebomb a place I worked at. And that whole thing started off because the University of Vermont, UVM, had two working oxes, Bill and Lou, the word the ox's name. And one of them became a lame and they were like 10 years old and they were going as part of a working ag program that they were going to process them and then uh, serve that harvest product in the, you know, in the cafeteria. And it was going to complete this loop. They were working oxen. They were designed to carry carts. And one of them uh, became to the age where it couldn't do that. And the other was, you know, broke its leg and became lame. So they, they had an outrage when it leaked that our slaughterhouse was going to uh, kill these animals. But I guess the alternative was that for them was to let them die in vain and not go to nourish people. So Homeland security came out and, went over our food safety protocol, made sure we have cameras working, make sure we're properly locked, that the closing people at the end of the day know to lock the the slaughterhouse and to keep, uh, you know, certain things. And because ALF, the Animal Liberation Front, is recognized as a terrorist group. It's homeland, uh, homegrown terrorism. And they have set abattoirs on fire and i know there's one case where they've incidentally killed the the a you know security guard working at a slaughterhouse and that's just i guess one against however many millions of animals died some fucked up scorecard they have so i don't know if that answers that question next one someone asked when it comes to extra fat silver skin etc. What do you do with it? Well, you could turn that fat into hot dogs. You could turn it into lardo. You could also add, you know, heavy silver skinned items such as shank meat into emulsification product because it has a lot of good uh, collagen like properties. You could take that fat, you could cut it real nice and thin and make beautiful fat roses that just liven up your case. Get that nice silver skin in between the uh, gristle seam of the flat iron and uh, put it on your shirt and pretend it's a tie. You could take lamb suet, rub it on your shoes when it's warm, right out of the animal for waterproofing. Here's a question. Do you think there's a difference between a cutter and a butcher? So when I was younger, I, I we did a whole episode about about this uh and i encourage you to go back and listen to all of our episodes because they're amazing but when i was younger yeah i i thought just personally like because people always want to strive for the next step and once you reach that next step you want to look down at the step you were at so it's like when i 
when I was working slaughter, uh, then I would say like, well, what's the definition of a butcher? Someone who skins, uh, dresses, cuts and sells meat. <laughs> so there's multiple things right there. So I was like, so I can, I'm a butcher. I'm not a slaughterman. I'm a butcher. Then when I became moved into the cut side of the facility, I'd be like, well, now I'm a real butcher before I was just a fucking slaughterman, but now I'm a real butcher. And then when I started selling meat and uh, I'd be like, well, I'm still a butcher. I'm selling it. That's technically it. And I do all these other steps. So blah, 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 blah. All that stuff. does uh, They're just semantics and names and they don't mean anything. It's like, well, they do in a certain sense. If you call yourself a butcher, you, I think should be able to read a cut sheet and execute it to some degree. But as far as using it as a term to build yourself up and push other people down, get out of here with that. I ain't got time for that. And when I first moved to Washington, people would, butchers were the terminology locally was if you were a butcher, you were a slaughterman. If you were a meat cutter, you were a butcher. And, and if that makes sense, that like, Slaughtermen were called butchers and meat meat cutters were meat cutters. And those were the distinction. And every time I would, I was just so used to saying the word butcher, it just added this weird confusion. And then it also like added this like just shitty feeling like, oh, so you, wor you work on the, so you do slaughter. And uh, this would only be in cer certain circles when I'm meeting people. And I'd be like, well, yeah, I work in slaughter, but I also cut me oh so you're a meat cutter and make me like why is there this weird distinction and now i'm i feel bad and weird for no reason here's a question i got on a scale of ar-15 to screaming eagle how american are you well that's an interesting scale and i would like to say i'm as american as mcdonald's and adult onset diabetes. Someone asked, wheezing rod or just your arm for loosening the esophagus? Well, for those of you who don't know, when on beef, especially and sometimes lamb, but I never did it on pork, that you wheeze the animal. This is so you close off the esophagus so it doesn't leak stomach content or cut or uh, ingest the out of its mouth while it's hanging upside down during the sanitary dressing and this is I could be completely wrong because I'm not a, a scientist but maybe you don't do it on pigs because they're not a because uh, they have a single chamber stomach and and sheep and cows don't. Maybe they, they throw up easier on themselves when they're upside down or if their contents loosen. Interesting, too, that animals that chew their cud, you know, are genuinely uh, are kosher. So giraffes are kosher. But anyway, so you have to close off the esophagus and loosen it up from the trachea. And on lambs, I do this 100% with my hands and then usually tie tied in a knot and on beef i loosen it up with my hands to a point and then if i'm using a high rail i'm going to uh, connect a wheezing rod which is this metal rod with a curly cue at the end wrap it around the esophagus and slide it up the trachea towards the animal's butt and this wad rod is about two and a half to three feet long and then once you hit the stomach you don't want to push too hard because even though it is rounded tips it will burst through the stomach and you end up with a worse problem than you did and i have seen that many times where a wheeze bus and then uh some people use zip ties i don't like using zip ties because sometimes they end up getting sharp edges getting stuck when you're taking it out of the wheeze or feeding it through the in between the hanger stake actually is where that uh, wheeze 
runs through that little hole through it. And I, I like using butcher's twine. Um, it's easier in a pulls and it's biodegradable. Doing custom exempt, I don't do any of that. Uh, I just kind of remove all the innards of the animal at once, then harvest the organs when they're on top of the pile. I'll get a, out of here on this. I want to ask Victor Knox or Dexter Russell. So never used Dexter Russell. Don't know much about them. I always thought their handles looked too clunky for me. And then I worked with this guy, John Steins, who told me that Dexter Russell hasn't been good since the seventies because, uh, they changed owners or the son took over and he just doesn't know how to run the, the company. And they're located in new England and John was from new England. So I was like, you know what, John, you probably know your shit. And this whole thing came up because he was, uh, citing a lamb at his grant uh, or at his dad's farm. His dad passed away, uh, about 20 years before this. And he just so happened to be there helping out his mom, uh, his mom's friend and he was skinning a lamb for the first time in that barn since he was growing up and reached over to a stud where he used to put his lamb skinner when he was a kid and there was a dexter russell from his dad sitting there and he's like oh wow you know this this is wild took it rinsed it uh cleaned it up real good didn't treat the pitted steel at all. And just, he said, once he got the edge on it, it edged up real nice. And so vector knocks now are made with stainless steel. And I think same with, uh, Dexter Russell's and companies like F Dick and I don't know, like chef knives or whatever are made with high carbon steel, which it's harder. Uh, it's been carbon treated, which means that it's easier or it's harder to get an edge on. So stainless steel, it's easier to put an edge on. It's easier to lose your edge. But I guess, you know, for how much I'm using my knives, honestly, I think that uh, I like a stainless edge because in my work environment, I'm, I once I, I sharpen my knives uh, every day uh, using a mechanical true hone, and you know some people will say like tri stone and all that. Like I know how to use the tri stone, um, and I could get a beautiful edge on a tri stone and using a hollow grinder. But I don't need to do that for what I'm doing. If I was working slaughter, I would probably you know, use a different sharpening message method than I do now. But the true hone works great for the applications I'm using it for, especially when I'm only using like $15 knives. If you want to know those knives, maybe those knives companies should sponsor the show. And that brings me to the end. If you want to help out the show, I want you to rate and review us on iTunes and tag people on social media grow the show. The best way to get more people out there is to leave a review on iTunes. If you want to get a hold of us, you could email us at the podcast at gmail.com. You could tweet us at the meat pod. If you want to get a hold of David? He is at a farm butcher on Instagram. Ryan is at gather and break on Instagram. And I am at American butcher on Instagram and Facebook. Please check out the show notes and support the butchers of America team and a concept right now happening in whip is someone emailed me about hazing in the industry. And I certainly have my amazing stories and I, you know, I'm going to share it with you. It's all I do is just talk and yap and blah, blah, blah. But if you have a hazing story or a situation when you first got into the food service industry, let's expand it to that. Or, the slaughter industry or the meat cutting industry. Say someone froze your knives in blood. Say people did mean stuff and just banged, you know, trays around when they were running low on trays and everyone would yell at the new person, but in sequence, yelling, feed me. 
because they weren't producing the meat quick enough or they were slow on a station. So the whole floor starts saying, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it's not making the person work any faster. And then when they're realizing like what, what they're talking about me, oh, I'm slowing them down because I'm not feeding them this product and you're going slower and you're going slower. And then people start throwing hard hats at you. And people start throwing, you know, pieces of hide at you. And it's just making your job go slower. And then uh, you, you walk out or you like yell and everyone just cheers because they broke you. Maybe you don't have a story that relates like that. Anyway, keep your knives sharp and live at the margin.